Hello QCon, my name is Gene Kim and I've been studying high performing technology organizations since 1999. And that was a journey that started back when I was a CTO and founder of a company called Tripwire in the information security space. Uh, our goal was to study these high performing organizations that simultaneously had the best project due date performance and development, the best operational reliability and stability, as well as the best posture of security and compliance, and understand how did they make their good to great transformation so that other organizations could replicate those amazing outcomes. So in a 21 year journey, there were many surprises, but by far the biggest surprise was how it took me in the middle of the DevOps movement, which I think is urgent and important. The last time that any industry has been disrupted to the extent that our industry is being disrupted today was likely manufacturing when it was revolutionized through the application of the lean principles. And I think that's exactly what uh, DevOps is. You take those same lean principles, apply them to the technology value stream that we work in every day, and you end up with these emergent patterns that allow for organizations to do tens, hundreds, or even hundreds of thousands of deployments per day while preserving world-class reliability, security, and stability, something that I didn't even think possible uh, 15 years ago. So in 2013, I co-wrote a book called The Phoenix Project, and I can't overstate just how much I've learned since then. So what I'm presenting here today is not so much DevOps, uh, but on uh, something I wrote last year called My Love Letter to Closure. So Randy Schaup, uh, who's on the program committee, reached out and asked if I would present on why I wrote this letter and what I learned. And so, of course, I said yes. So the intended audience for this talk is that as anyone who has even the remotest interest in functional programming, as well as anyone who used to love programming, and yet over the years, maybe the joy associated with programming uh, has faded. Um, because that was absolutely... Uh, you know, my case as well. And so over the years, I wrote, uh, co-authored a bunch of books, including The Phoenix Project, DevOps Handbook, uh, The Accelerate Book with Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Just Humble, and most recently, The Unicorn Project. And I'll just put it out there that uh, a definition that uh, we put into the DevOps Handbook, that uh, DevOps really is the architectural practices, technical practices, and cultural norms that allow us to increase our ability to deliver application services quickly and safely. This allows for rapid experimentation and innovation, as well as the fastest possible delivery of value to our customers while preserving world-class security, reliability, and stability. And so why do we care about that? And so that we can win in the marketplace. And yet, as much as I love that definition, there's a definition I love even more that comes from John Smart. And his definition is simply this, it's better value, sooner, safer, and happier. And so I'd like to really zoom in on one word, which is happier. I think no one can argue that we, anyone wants actually worse value later with more danger, with more misery. And closure really introduced the joy of programming back into my life. And so maybe to put this into perspective, for decades, I self-identified as an ops person. And this is despite getting my graduate degree in compiler design and high-speed networking. And so it was always my observation that it was ops where the saves were made. It was ops who saved our customers from terrible developers who didn't care about quality. It was ops who protected our applications and data from bad actors because it certainly wasn't ineffective security people. And yet four years ago when I learned closure, uh, I changed my mind. I now self-identify decisively as a developer. And I think it's because development is so fun these days and you can do so many miraculous things uh, with so little effort. And finally, at the age of 49, I can finally build things that don't collapse in on itself like a house of cards, which is a something I've suffered from for nearly 30 years. And so many of these aha moments really came from learning closure. So the famous French philosopher Claude Levi-Strauss would say of certain tools, is it a good tool to think with? And there are things in functional programming and in closure uh, that I think are astonishingly good uh, tools to think with. Uh, I'm going to make this claim that 90% of the errors I made for 30 years have almost vanished. Um, and I'm going to describe why. So I remember in 2016 or 2017, I remember seeing this amazing graphic on Twitter that described the difference between passing variables by value versus passing variables uh, by reference. And so back when I was studying programming languages, uh, languages in 1993, most mainstream languages supported only passing variables by value which meant if you passed a variable to a function and you changed it, it only changed the local copy inside the function. And so that's the way most programming languages did things. And it's not bad, uh, but I certainly viewed it as very inconvenient because if you wanted to modify a variable, you had to return it. Um, and so this meant that uh, if you had big structures or classes with tons of fields, you had to do a lot of typing which is tedious, error prone, and very time consuming. I often found myself complaining about this, wishing there were a better way. And so 
uh, the way we often addressed uh, it was using memory pointers, uh, which introduced a whole different set of problems because it was so easy to change something that you shouldn't, uh, potentially crashing the program or introducing uh, grievous uh, vulnerabilities into your programming program. And so this is now considered so dangerous that few programs besides Assembler, C, and C++ uh, support pointers. In fact, one of Rust's main selling points is that it's uh, safer <laughs> than these other languages. So in 1995, I got introduced to uh, what I thought was a huge innovation in programming languages, uh, that you could pass variables by reference. So it showed up in C++ and Java, and it allows you to pass a variable into uh, a function and actually modify it. And I loved it because it was such a time saver, because it uh, let you write less code. And I, that's why I thought it was so great. But four years ago, uh, learning Clojure, I changed my mind. And I think one of the hallmarks of functional programming languages, whether it's Clojure, Haskell, F-sharp, uh, is a notion of immutability and pure functions. Uh, they typically don't let you change variables and uh, the functions need to be pure, meaning the functions always return the same output given the same inputs. And uh, there are no side effects allowed. So you're not allowed to change the world around you or certainly change the world outside of uh, your function. And uh, so even writing to disk is not allowed and even reading disks is not allowed. Uh, it wouldn't be called pure because it's not always the same. And so this is, really led to one of my biggest aha moments, just seeing how terrifying passing variables by reference should be to everyone. Because when you see this coffee cup filling up, what you see really should be something like this, is who's messing with my coffee cup and how do I make them stop? The point here is that it's very difficult to understand your code and to reason about it when anyone else can change your internal state. And so if you've heard of Heisenbugs, uh, this is the phenomenon where even the act of observation uh, changes the results. And this is a classic a hallmark of multi-threading errors, which is one of the most difficult problems in distributed systems. So I'm trying to uh, di uh, uh, troubleshoot my coffee cup and I can't get it to fill up again. And uh, I, so in other words, I can't replicate uh, the failure cases, uh, which are failing in production, sometimes spectacularly. And so in the real world, uncontrolled mutation makes things extraordinarily difficult to reason about and predict what will happen. So John Carmack influenced so many of us. Uh, he was one of the founders of id Software. Uh, he created, uh, helped create Doom and Quake. He was formerly a CTO of Oculus VR. And he wrote an amazing article in 2013 in the Gama Sutra magazine about the power of using functional programming concepts in C++. Uh, he wrote about it uh, in 2013, and he talked about it at the QuakeCon keynote. And he, here's his pragmatic summary. Uh, he says, a large fraction of the flaws in software development are due to programmers not fully understanding all the possible states that their code may execute in. In a multi-threaded environment, the lack of understanding and the resulting problems are greatly amplified, <laughs> almost to the point of panic, if you are paying attention. So for those of you who've read uh, Brian Getz's amazing book, Java Concurrency in Practice, you probably shared my feeling of utter horror, realizing just how dangerous concurrency is, even when you think you know what you're doing, like I did. And personally speaking, when I read that book, I was horrified and I was left wondering how many hidden bombs did I put into production uh, that could go off in any moment. So what we often find as uh, software engineers is that state management is something that we have extraordinary difficulty with, especially if other people are allowed to change our internal state, uh, maybe without even telling us. Because in the real world, the universe that our program operates in, or the universe that your components operate in, is far vaster than just one coffee mug. In fact, uh, if you zoom out, there are many coffee cups beside you, any of one of whom uh, can be changing your internal state. Uh, just because they have a reference to your object or your variable. So under these conditions, it becomes wildly difficult to know what the side effects of your operations are or what the side effects of someone else's operations are. And so one of the beliefs in the functional programming community is that uncontrolled mutation is at the very limits of what humans can reason about to understand and to be able to test. And so uh, there is a well-known duality of code and data. In other words, all functions can be replaced by data and all data can be replaced by code, uh, given enough space and time, of course. And so everyone now knows that go-tos are considered harmful, as stated by Dr. Dijkstra in 1968. And so it, it, the duality of code and data also seems to suggest that uncontrolled state mutation should also be considered harmful. And so um, 
when I was running the Unicorn Project, there were certain things that I wanted to explore uh, deeper. And one was the absence of understanding of all the invisible structures uh, needed to truly enable developer productivity. Uh, the orthogonal problem of data, how do it we get to it to where it needs to go, which is in the hands of anyone who makes decisions. Uh, strong opposition to support these newer ways of working and ambiguity of what behaviors we actually need from leaders to support such a transformation. And so in the Phoenix Project, we had the three ways, the four types of work, and the, in the Unicorn Project, I had the five ideals. And the goal was to really try to elevate concepts I think are really important uh, to help us get from here to there. And so the first is locality and simplicity. The second is focus, flow, and joy. The third is improvement of daily work. The fourth is psychological safety. And the fifth is customer focus. And the first two ideals really came from uh, my learnings through learning closure. So I mentioned in October 2019, I wrote this 8,500 word long blog post trying to summarize what I had learned and uh, why those concepts are so important to me. And maybe just to paint some context, uh, here's a diagram that shows the cumulative lines of uh, code I've written over the years. And the point here is that uh, that middle band, I went almost a decade without writing much code uh, in my daily work. The reason why I thought the value uh, was all in processes, not in the technology uh, that we used. And I certainly changed my mind uh, since then. And by the way, the other takeaway here is that the majority of my experience was written, uh, was writing C and C++. Um, and I actually never learned, I only wrote a couple hundred lines of Java. And my point here is that uh, I'm going to make the case that me learning closure is sort of like Encino Man learning to drive. Uh, Encino Man is, of course, the movie about the caveman, about someone who is frozen in time and wakes up in a completely changed modern world. Learning closure without having any background in Java was also, uh, I felt some anguish around because I got stuck in this cul-de-sac of C, C++, and Perl, and I never got to experience the magic of Common Lisp um, or Java for that matter. So my point here is that if I can, anyone can. So let me talk more concretely about how and why Java brought the joy of coding back into my life. I had spent 30 years with certain self-sabotaging habits uh, where I tended to blow up my own code. And I actually got to see how dramatic a difference Clojure made uh, in an application that I've helped uh, write or co-write three times. So in 2011, uh, we wrote an, an application called TweetScriber, uh, which allowed uh, one to take notes at a conference and tweet at the same time, which is actually really, really helpful if you're writing a book. And so uh, Flynn and Rachel, they wrote it in Objective-C, uh, which was amazing. It took about 3,000 lines of code. Uh, it's kept working great until iOS 7, <laughs> and then it totally broke. Uh, in 2015, uh, I rewrote it in TypeScript and React, and it took about one half the number of lines of code. And then in 2017, I took a stab at rewriting it in ClojureScript and Reframe, and I was able to do it in one third again the number of lines of code. And uh, it was amazing to me that Clojure runs on the JVM uh, or can be transpiled into JavaScript and then thus can leverage all of the open source ecosystems around in NPM and Maven. So uh, let's go to the first ideal of locality and simplicity. So simply put, um, if the Phoenix Project had one metric, it was all about the bus factor. In other words, how many people need to be hit by a bus before the project, service, or organization is in grave jeopardy? And in the Phoenix Project, uh, the bus factor was one, right? It was Brent. If Brent got hit by a bus, uh, no outage could be fixed, and no major complex piece of work could be done uh, without Brent. And uh, so obviously we want a bus factor far larger uh, than one. We want to be reliant on not one individual, but in a team, or better yet, a team of teams. So in the unicorn project, the corresponding metric is the lunch factor as measured by to get something meaningful done, uh, that's something that you need to get done done, how many people do you need to take out to lunch? Is it the Amazon ideal of the two pizza team where every team uh, that can be fed with no more than two pizzas can independently develop and test and deploy value to the customer? Or do we need to feed everyone in the building? So if you think of uh, large, complex deployments that span scores of teams, you might have to be feeding 100, 200, even 300 people, maybe even for days, right? Or uh, if you're trying to implement a feature and you are now dependent on uh, 43 different other components, then you potentially have to take out 43 different people out to lunch, right? And if any of them say no, <laughs> uh, then uh, you can't actually get done uh, what you need to get done. And the reason why this happens is that uh, 
functionality is now smeared across 43 different uh, teams. And so I really learned this lesson from Rich Hickey, who created the Clojure Functional Programming Language. Uh, so uh, the two talks I would recommend to everyone is his Strange Loop conference in 2011 and his Java 1 presentation that he made to uh, 2015 to a CE of Java developers. And that notion of the lunch factor really came from that Java 1 talk, where he described uh, when you are coupled to so many different teams that you actually can't get anything done. <laughs> and so uh, ideal is really it crystallizes the notion that in the ideal anyone can implement what they need to by looking at one file one module one namespace one application one container right and make all the needed changes there not ideal is that you have to understand all the files and change potentially all the modules all the namespaces all the applications all the containers because again functionality is now smeared across that entire surface area Ideal is that changes can not only be independently implemented, but also independently tested, isolated from all the other components. And so that's the notion of a composability. Uh, not ideal is that in order for us to get any assurance that our changes will actually work in production, uh, we have to test it in the presence of all the other components. And that's what often draws us to these uh, scarce integrated test environments, of which there are never enough, they're never cleaned up, <laughs> which actually jeopardizes uh, all of the test objectives. To share the depth of this aha moment, uh, I want to go all the way back to 1995, just to share with you how long I've been making this mistake. So it's in 1995 at the University of Arizona. I'm taking my graduate uh, uh, high-speed compiler course, and uh, we're supposed to build a Modula 2 compiler in C++, uh, which outputted Spark assembly code, which we would then com uh, compile into a Spark executable. So we had to write the lexer, the parser, generate the AST, the IR, and generate assembly code. And it started out pretty great uh, because uh, you know, I had used Lex and the X before, but th there was a specific feeling I had uh, when we were going through uh, the different phases of the project. And I kept on eventually thinking, okay, here goes nothing. I'm putting my code somewhere where I can no longer access it. It felt like throwing my code into a deep, dark well and just hoping that it worked. And so uh, it turns out it did not work so well. So uh, we had test cases uh, that would be run, uh, which essentially would take Modular 2 uh, programs that we just execute it and then check the results. And everything worked pretty well until uh, the recursive test cases. Uh, it turns out that my programs kept blowing up after a certain number of recursive calls. Um, I think what was happening was actually uh, marching through my stack backwards for local variables, <laughs> and, but I ran out of time. I couldn't fix the mess I had created, and I had to submit my fatally flawed compiler, and I'm sure I had one of the lowest scores in the class. And believe it or not, 30 years later while learning Clojure, I finally realized what I was doing wrong, that I had my mistake was uh, writing my code in such a way that I could not independently run and test each one of the phases. You know, the good way is that you have each one of these phases uh, that you can feed in an input for and independently test. So you, you tokenize the source files and then you pass it to the abstract syntax tree, you generate the intermediate representation, you generate the assembly output, and then you finally output the file. You push the side effects to the, uh, to the edges. What I was doing uh, 30 years ago was I was taking each one of those phases and tucking it into uh, the previous phase. So now I can no longer test each one of those phases independently. So I was breaking the notion of composability where you could independently run and test each one of those components. So I think that's so important. So the first ideal is about uh, locality and simplicity. Uh, the second ideal is about focus, flow, and joy. So I had mentioned this great quote by Claude Levi-Strauss, is it a good tool to think with? And certainly immutability, pure functions, composability uh, are great tools to think with. Uh, I would also put in item potence up there as well. What excites me so much is that these are no longer in the domain of just programming languages. They are showing up in infrastructure and operations as well. Docker is fundamentally immutable, right? If you want to make a persistent change to a container, uh, you can't. You actually have to make a new one. Uh, Kubernetes takes that same concept, but not just at the system level, but at the system of systems level. Uh, whenever you see something like uh, Apache Kafka, someone's thinking about uh, how to create an immutable data model. Same with CQRS. Uh, and version control is fundamentally immutable, which is why we get yelled at uh, when we rewrite the commit history, because we're not allowed to change the past. And I think the outcome of using the be these better tools to think with is that in the ideal, our energy and time is focused on the business problem at hand, and we're having fun. 
not ideal is that we're finding we're spending all our time trying to solve problems that we don't even want to solve uh, things like writing yaml files or trying to figure out how to escape spaces inside of file names inside of make files so maybe one of the biggest surprises for me after learning closure is that uh, there are all these things that i used to enjoy 10 or 20 years ago but I, that i now detest Basically, I hate doing anything outside of my application. I become one of those developers. Um, I hate connecting anything to anything else because it always takes me a week. I hate updating dependencies because uh, when I do, everything breaks. I hate secrets management. Uh, I'm the one who always checks in secrets into the repo. Uh, I hate bash, YAML, patching. Uh, I can't figure out why my Kubernetes deployment files are broken and, or nor why my cloud costs are so high. And I don't mean to diminish any of these things. I think it's really to show how fussy I've become. <laughs> uh, and so this is one of the reasons why I'm such a fan of developer platforms. Uh, that uh, everything that we do, whether it's monitoring, deployment, environment creation, security scans, or orchestration, we can do through platforms, self-service and on demand uh, with, with immediacy and fast feedback as opposed to opening a ticket and waiting. And these are the conditions that allow us to have focus and flow, which I believe create the conditions uh, to actually have joy in our work. And when I talk about flow, uh, I'm referring to the work of the amazing work of Dr. Mihaly Csikszent Mihaly. Uh, he gave what I think is the best TED talk of all time, Flow, The Secret to Happiness. He wrote an amazing book called uh, Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. And he describes flow as that amazing uh, experience we have when we are so engrossed in the work that we love uh, that uh, we lose track of time and maybe even sense of self. That transcendental experience we have when we are truly engrossed doing the work that we love and that we're having fun. And he goes on to say that there are really two types of learning. There's procedural learning uh, and then there's one-shot learning. So procedural learning are those things that we uh, are the skills we grow over decades uh, that we love and appreciate. Uh, because, and every piece of new learning that we get, we uh, appreciate because we know that's going to help us for decades into the future. And on the opposite extreme is one-shot learning. These are the things that, uh, like trying to figure out how to write YAML files. We did not wake up uh, in the morning trying to figure out how to write correct YAML files. And so Rich Hickey had a wonderful phrase for this. Uh, the goal is to solve problems, not to solve puzzles. And he <laughs> actually called uh, the entire domain of category theory to potentially fall uh, into this, a hallmark of many strongly typed functional programming languages. Now for me, uh, puzzles are trying to figure out how to escape spaces and file names or uh, write fast SQL statements. I've actually gotten in the habit of uh, uh, taking screenshots of my browser search history uh, just to remind myself of all the things where I spend hours trying to f solve something that is very distant from the business problem I'm trying to solve. And this is Java date time instances. I'm not uh, saying that uh, time is not important. In fact, time is absolutely critical. <laughs> but trust me, I did not wake up in that morning uh, saying I'm going to understand how to do uh, learn about uh, uh, time zones. So in the Unicorn Project, uh, my goal was to really highlight those concepts that are required to get us from here to there. And in the five ideals, locality and simplicity and focus, flow, and joy, I think are so important. And I learned that through the journey of learning closure and functional programming languages. So as a result, I am so grateful to Rich Hickey and the entire closure community for helping me learn what I need to learn in order to write this book. And by the way, it gives me such delight and joy <laughs> that the Unicorn Project actually hit uh, number two on the Wall Street Journal bestselling category in the hardcover business uh, category. And so uh, closure actually figures very prominently in the book. And it delights me to no end <laughs> that business leaders, whether they want to or not, are learning about functional programming uh, as they try to grapple with what digital disruption is and isn't and how to get there. So. As I had mentioned, the intended uh, audience for this talk was anyone who was remotely interested in functional programming and anyone who used to love coding, but they found that the joy of programming has faded over time. So if I could wave a magic wand, uh, anyone who uh, hears this talk can, will be thinking, hey, if Gene can do it, anyone can do it. And uh, this will be even more fun than I ever thought. And two is that, hey, I have actually felt less joy of programming and I'm now motivated to learn either Clojure or for that matter, any functional programming language. So thank you, KuCon. And for people interested in this topic, don't miss the closing keynote. I was able to chair a panel with Mike Nygaard, SVP of uh, Architecture at Sabre and Karen Meyer, Data Engineer at Reify Health. 
these are two people whose achievements I admire so much and I get to learn from them. What were the factors that led to their best peak experiences coding and their worst experiences coding and really shed lessons learned in terms of how to create an architecture so that every developer can be productive, have focus, flow, and joy. For anyone who would like a copy of this presentation, as well as a list of links that I mentioned, as well as a link to all the excerpts of basically everything I've written, just send an email to realgenekim at sendyourslides.com with the subject line of closure, and you will get an automated response within a minute or two. Thank you so much. See you around.